Hello, everybody, and welcome to our winter mentorship mini series, Building a Successful Functional Medicine Practice. I am Dr. Dan Kalish, and for those of you that are brand new to this, um, I am celebrating my 30th year in functional medicine this year. I started off in 1992 seeing patients, and um, my favorite experience of the last year or two is I walked into this room. It was at the CASI conference. I go to the CASI conference every year. If you don't go to the CASI conference, you should go. C-A-S-I, CASI conference. It's put on by Design for Health. So I walked into the room because it's the scientific advisory board I'm on, and I walked into the room for dinner. And there's some really heavy hitters here, like Dr. Diadamo was there. I mean, there are some big time important people in this room. Um, I'm like a small fry. And I looked around the room, I was like, gosh, I know all these people, you know, and I know, I'm like, these are my people, these are my tribe. We've all been at this for at least 30 years, you know, and how cool is that? That this medicine, this functional medicine thing that we all just imagined when we were young people in our 20s and 30s is now like a real thing. And it's super, super exciting. And one of the things that I've seen is this transition in functional medicine over all these years is, um, the growth of functional medicine as a business. And so I'm in a very specific place where I am, my business model, what I do for a living is help people start functional medicine practices and make it really profitable and train doctors in how to interpret labs and how to make the business model work. But I'm involved with advisory boards for a variety of different companies. I work with all the different lab companies, many of the top supplement companies really closely. I've worked with IFM really closely for many years. I've been to all the IFM events over and over again and spoken at all of them. And so I, I get to see the industry from a lot of different angles. And what my, I'm even more reinforced and more dedicated to you guys, to the, the practitioners out there now than ever. And the industry is growing up around us. The supplement companies are experiencing exponential growth. The lab companies have all kinds of money to bring us new lab tests. We're really on an upward curve. And what I wanna make sure is that you guys who are practicing can be super successful, have a profitable clinic, so you can do this for as long as you want and that you don't burn out. That's really the whole point. So when we say successful functional medicine practice, that's defined by me as you're happy, you're healthy, you're helping a lot of people, okay? And if you burn out as a practitioner, then we lose you and we're down one, you know, and that's not a good thing, okay? So here's me, I founded the Kalos Institute. We do all kinds of classes and things. I've worked with Mayo Clinic. I'm working really closely with Richard Lord right now. Um, I'm IFM certified, I passed the test. That was not an easy thing to do. So uh, we have, for those of you interested in business, we have our Business Essentials boot camp coming up in February. This is one of our more popular courses. You get 20% off if you use that code there, MINI23. And we only offer this maybe once or twice a year. So if you're at a point in your practice where you want to develop it more fully, where you feel like um, you want to get something new started, or if you're new in practice and you're wondering if, if you should even start a practice, I think this Business Essentials Bootcamp has been really good for people who are trying to decide, do I leave my day job as a chiropractor, medical doctor, acupuncturist? Do I start to transist? How can that work? You know, how, what are the logistics behind that? So we do financial planning, business planning, uh, marketing, sales, operations. It's a really good course. People like this one a lot. Okay. So if you're interested in business, check that out. And then we have our um, year-long mentorship starting now too. So if you're interested in really spending a year learning how to interpret labs and get into the deep end of the pool here. We have four or five hours a week where I'm reviewing labs with doctors. Everyone's submitting all their tests. There's a huge curriculum that I built out on how to interpret labs. And so you just get inundated with this. And by the end of the year, uh, people are really good at interpreting labs. And it's exciting for me to watch that transition. So it's very much an intensive course, but if you want to devote yourself to lab interpretation skills development. It's, I think, one of the better courses out there. You get 1199 bucks off if you use that discount code. I think that's usually our, our biggest discount that we ever give. So if you're interested in starting, it's a good time. And there's a January class, so you guys can jump in if you want. And then Rupa Health, if you're not using Rupa, you're kind of missing out. Um, pretty much everyone that we work with now uses Rupa Health for ordering labs. And you get 100 bucks off your first order if you haven't used them yet. They have a Basically, you know, 
connected all the different lab companies under one platform and it's a super easy platform to use and you end up i was probably accessed Rupa like five times a day. All the information that we need for our labs is just stored in one place. It's super easy, super inexpensive. And it's probably saved me and my practice $25,000, $30,000 a year in staff time to use Rupa. So it's kind of a no-brainer, right? And you get a hundred bucks off if you tell them whatever you have to do. Uh, for you just, I don't know how you tell them. There's probably some little thing you gotta say, hey, I'm referred by Kayla, you get a hundred bucks off, okay? All right, so this this class, you know, the, the purpose of this class is really to start to think about what are the common roadblocks and to remove them. You guys are welcome to ask questions. You can type a question into that little box there. And I'm not gonna cover all the slides in like a formal lecture. I'm just gonna kind of jump around, see what you guys are interested in, what you're asking questions about, and cover most of the slides. But it's not like a super formal lecture. It's a little more of a brainstorming session so you guys can get the information you need. Okay, but there are some common roadblocks. And the most common roadblock is that functional medicine is just an overwhelming subject area and that most people don't have a clear clinical model that kind of is blended with a comprehensive business model. And then you need legal strategy kind of mixed in there. I didn't put that on the slide because that freaks people out. But if you have a super clear clinical model, you know exactly what labs you're ordering and why and what you're gonna do with every patient. And then you have a good business model that supports that. And then you have legal strategy in place so everything's lawful and above board and you're not gonna get in trouble in any way you can rock it, you know, and you can be super, super successful. Um, we also then are gonna get into the common pitfalls, which is like the disorganization and lack of attention to business. You know, that's kind of the primary things that undermine people, um, really, and it doesn't have to be that way. And I think the main takeaway point for today is that as much as we all put so much energy into our patients and helping them, we need to put equal amounts of energy into ourselves and keeping ourselves healthy, fit, educated, on top of things so you can last. And then you need to put an equal amount of energy into your practice and the development of the operations and logistics and financial planning and business planning of the practice. And if you can have equal time and energy for all three of these until they're all humming along really well, then you can let the pedal off the gas a little bit in one area, you know? But until you get all three of these working really well, if you don't, you're gonna end up with burnout. And what we see almost all the time, pay, uh, doctors, practitioners burn out around the 10 or 12 year mark because they haven't been taking care of themselves and because they've been working too many hours because their practice business model just is crappy, <laughs> you know, basically. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I was thinking about my first practice and I'm not making this up, it's a true story, okay? so. Um, I won't mention who it was, but it was Glenn. Glenn, it was Glenn's office. Glenn's office, and I was his associate. And they had, this wasn't that long ago, okay? This was 30 years ago. They had a ledger that was like this big. It was huge. It was like several feet long. A paper ledger. This is like paper. And the bookkeeping was done with a pen and pencil in this paper ledger. The entire office ran around this one ledger. And it was so wildly inaccurate. There's no number in there that made any sense. And so they would come to the point where, oh, it's time to pay Dan for his 50%, you know, and they would look at the ledger and it's just, so I, I'm very familiar with dysfunctional practice models and business models that are just antiquated and horrible. And it's just, you, you want to put as much energy into the business development as you can, because it'll just make your whole life so much easier going forward once you figure it out. Okay, and then the other place where people fall apart is they just don't take care of themselves. And it's like a full-time job. I mean, lugging this body around. Like today, I got up at five in the morning, 4.45. This is not a sign of virtue. This is just like a survival technique, right? I did 10 minutes of stretching, 10 minutes uh, on the rowing machine. That was like my cardio workout. Um, I did weights later. And then I did a 20 minute sauna and I did about three and a half minutes in my cold plunge, which is 45 degrees right now. I mean, that was a lot of work, right? And then I got my lemon water, and then I started my job, job, job. And so that attention to meditation, to exercise, to detoxification through saunas, through shocking your cardiovascular system with cold therapy, to green juicing or whatever it is that you do, having that you know extreme attention on yourself and the physical conditioning and Emotional, spiritual conditioning of yourself is the key to successful practice. Otherwise, people burn out, okay? Um, 
when we talked to doctors and we did this survey a little while ago about what are the biggest challenges, the number one biggest challenge, it's hard to read this how small type, was finding new patients and, and then patient compliance and retention, online marketing. But if you look at almost all of the top three there, are really centered around the same question, which is getting and retaining patients. So we're going to talk about how you can get and re get and retain patients. You know, what are the major ways that you can do that, okay? And then on the clinical challenges side, managing complex patients, you know, that's the number one thing. And so as much as possible, we want practices that are mixed. So you're not in a situation where 100% of your patients are incredibly complex because that's going to lead to burnout. The cynicism, exhaustion, the doubt, the wondering why you're doing this. Large amounts of practitioners, majority of practitioners end up burning out, okay? And that's not what we want. We want you to figure out what you're the best at, what drives your economic engine that you can make money from, but more importantly, what you're really passionate about, okay? Typically, burnout hits around year 10 to 12, so we see those first five years, nobody really burns out in their first five years because you're just go, go, going so hard, right? Then you hit year five or so and you're starting to build, 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 things are getting better, but then somewhere around year 10, 11, 12, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to be physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted and things are going to fall apart. So we're trying to make it so that you can build, grow, and transition without the falling apart part, okay? Um, and, so, and then when we look at, okay, what makes a super successful practice? And that's one way to figure this out, right? Which is to see what's working for people, okay? And um, what's not, you know? And... Um, Well, and I've studied this, you know, because I've talked to like hundreds of doctors a year, what's working, what's not working. Um, I've had so many practitioners that I've worked with that have just burst into tears and just broken down when during our conversations because people are on the edge. Things are not going okay for a lot of us, you know, and a lot of this is going to center around, you know, business and the structure of the business. So, we want to then, for those of us that are struggling a little bit or wanting to make our practices better, you just want to look to the people that are super successful where it's working really well, okay? And there's a very predictable model that works really well. And I'm going to try to go through a few slides on that right now so you guys can get a sense of what are the things that you may be able to shift with, okay? So one is having a focused approach. And having a target market that's clear. For me, it's always been what I call the big five, which is fat, fatigued, depressed, female hormones, and GI problems. For most of my practice life, that's what I've been focused on. Fat, fatigue, depressed, female hormones, and GI problems. Patients that are struggling with those issues, I find that functional medicine works really well for that crowd. And there's a lot of people with those problems, you know, and they're really, easy, I wouldn't say easy to fix, but pretty straightforward to fix. It, we're not talking about mold, Lyme disease, you know, chronic Lyme with a neuropsychiatric overlay, uh, chronic fatigue, and uh, I don't know, you know, dementia, okay? I get patients with all those problems, but my focus is on fat fatigue, depressed female hormones, and GI issues. And so that a certain percentage of my practice, maybe 30% or more, are very complex people that are way beyond the big five but that the bulk of the patients that I work with are in this target market. And so I can have a sustainable business model because the bulk of my patients, maybe 60, 70% of them are easy. They're gonna get better in a year. And that 30% that are chronically ill or have neuropsychiatric Lyme disease or whatever kind of complex mold thing is going on or memory loss thing is going on, that group that's really much more challenging is um, I'm able to work with them without burning out because I have a structure to to what I'm doing and I only market to um, the group that I want to work with and then uh, all these other people end up finding you anyways right so you don't have to go out looking for um, you know Parkinson's patients they're going to find you if they find out that you're good at working with neurodegenerative problems okay um, you want to have a reproducible model and so for a lot of practitioners if you've been in practice for a while we see like that web page the home page on the website and it's like what do I do and there's like 37 different things that they list out, you know, and it's just like hard for patients to figure out what's happening, you know, and it's hard for you to scale that and to reproduce that if you're all over the map. 
So when I was uh, coaching one of the IFM faculty a while ago, we, we looked at her um, apothecary, you know, and she had a couple hundred different supplements that she was selling. She had like five or six different forms of CoQ10. And I was like, Mary, that's not her real name. I was like, Mary, hey, you know, we just got to scale this back. You know, can you drop it down to maybe 75 or 80 products? She was like, sure, I could do that. And so, you know, things are just flying out the door and getting rid of all kinds of stuff. So streamlining and making yourself more efficient if you've been in practice for a long time. And if you're getting started now or you're thinking about getting started in a functional medicine practice, then you want to start building your model first before you actually start your practice. And if you think about if you were opening a restaurant, you wouldn't open a restaurant and just have on the sign just says restaurant and then people come in and you say oh what do you want to eat and you know and somebody wants sushi somebody wants a burger somebody wants burrito somebody says oh i want french onion soup and you'll be like oh okay let me run out and get all that stuff and figure that out no when you open a restaurant it says like burritos and then people know when they walk in that they can get burritos and you've defined what you're doing right you have a model you have a structure there everybody knows what's happening and if you're in a burrito shop and someone walks in and asks for sushi, you can immediately just think, well, no, we don't do that here, okay? And so you don't have to offer everything to everybody. And in fact, you can't really offer everything to everybody. That's one of the bigger problems, okay? So you want a reproducible, clear clinical model. And then the bulk of your referrals, almost all of your business, should come from patients of yours. They call that mining the install base, right? So current patients of yours should be generating the bulk of your business. If that's not happening, there's something wrong with your practice internally that you need to fix, okay, if that's not happening. So that goes back to these slides here when we, you know, questioned everybody, what are your biggest problems? Finding new patients, patient compliance and retention, understanding online marketing. Well, that's all the same problem because if you're getting and holding on to the bulk of your new patients, you don't need a lot of new patients because the old people are coming back and staying with you. If you improve your compliance and retention and people are staying on programs and doing programs and staying engaged, you don't need a ton of new people all the time. If your main problem is finding new people, really the problem is probably more around retention and being able to keep people engaged with your practice. So we wanna think about that, okay? And we can focus on that tonight just a little bit, all right? Um, so I have these five pillars. We can skip around a little bit um, because we probably don't have time to cover all of these, but I want you to be able to see them. So defining your niche, we talked about that a little bit. My niche was the big five, fat, fatigue, depressed, female hormones, and GI problems. Um, my favorite niche of all time was this guy in New York. This is my favorite niche of all time. I'm not saying you should do this, but it was a really good idea. And so we were at some kind of conference, this is a long time ago, it's like 15 or 20 years ago, where somehow people were talking about their practices. And so, so what do you do? He says, oh, I work with new brides. I'm like, new brides? Like, yeah, he's like women that want to get married or getting married. His whole practice, well, he was in New York City, his whole practice in New York City was working with women who are about to get married. And he's like, I'm like that. To me, it seemed a little strange. I must have had a funny look on my face. He's like, yeah, they're completely motivated. They do everything that I ask them to. They want their skin to look great. They want their weight to be really great. They want to fit in the dress. They want to be energetic. They want to have their sex drive be really great. It's just a wonderful group of people to work with. So I find women who are getting you know, married in the next year, and they refer other women who are getting married in the next year, and that's my entire practice. Um, that's a strange niche, but wow, well, how creative is that? I've had other people that work only with professional golfers. We have a doctor that did the mentorship a while back who only works with professional tennis players. We have people that only work with kids, only work with older adults, only work with dementia cases, only work with Hashimoto's. Another one of my favorites is we have one of my graduates that only does H. pylori. Who would have thought, you know, he, that's all he does. His whole practice is just H. pylori. He's not even just a gut guy. He's just a gut guy who only does H. pylori, has a huge business all around just H. pylori. So your niche could be all of humanity or your niche could be, you know, professional golfers. It really almost doesn't matter. It's whatever makes you really excited. One of my favorite new graduates from the mentorship, her niche is diabetes. And she does vegan diet, diets. She's very 
strict vegan and all her patients have to become vegan and she works with diabetics who are willing to and excited about going on a vegan diet to reverse their diabetes. There are all kinds of different ways that you can do this, okay? Um, but you don't have to do everything. In fact, it's a good idea to not try to do everything. And here's my big five, you know, fat, fatigue, depressed, female hormones, and GI. The most common errors that we see, and this is, if you're getting started, you have to be careful about this because you're gonna, almost everybody does this. You need to avoid, number one, you need to avoid um, just working with really hard patients in the very beginning, okay? And you need to avoid just letting people randomly come to you. So when you set up your website, you set up your marketing, you set up your messaging, you want to be really clear about the type of people that you want to work with rather than just letting people show up and having, you know, fate kind of dictate what you end up doing, okay? And having a, the niche that you pick, and even if it's a broad niche like um, pediatrics or a broad niche like um, men's health, you know, even if it's a broad niche like that, just making sure that it's something that you really enjoy and that you can imagine doing every day for a really long time, right? And the thing that's nice about this is that when people get good at this stuff, then, you know, if you're doing men's health, then you get really good at men's health. If you're working with pregnant, you know, women and new women that have just had babies, you get really good at that. So there's something nice about a niche in that you really build up your expertise quite quickly. Um, once you've got your niche, you know, you can start to think of, you've chosen it, right? You can start to think about how you're going to actually promote yourself. So my first niche, my first few years of practice was all around female hormones. And so all the lectures that I did, we didn't have websites back then, but, you know, all the public speaking that I did and all the marketing that I did was all oriented around female hormones. And that worked for me for quite a few years. It was very successful. Uh, the second pillar is forecasting financial success. And so this one is probably the most emotionally charged, um, but we have a financial planning worksheet that we use. And this has been uh, both a blessing and a curse to a lot of people that take the classes that we do. And um, because it forces you to just deal with reality. And I'll just show you a version of it here. Let's see, I can pull it up. Uh, here we go. So it's our financial planning worksheet. So first of all, on the first page, it has this monthly forecast. That's your income that's going to be coming in. And it takes all those numbers and it pushes them over to the second page where you can also include all your expenses. So you can end up seeing what your uh, net profit's going to be. Okay, what's your net profit margin? All right. And so as much as this is a, a kind of emotionally charged topic, this document probably has solved more practice problems than anything else that I've ever used in all the different classes that I've taught. Because when people look at the numbers, they get a reality check about whether what they want to do is realistic or not, you know, to pull off, whether they can really make it work or not. And oftentimes doing a business plan, you know, financial plan like I just showed you, is way more effective way to figure out if something's going to work than just trying it and then seeing that it's not working and then losing a lot of money and then being you know kind of in a bad place because of it so that's pretty important all right and um we want to make sure that as much as possible you do the planning stuff first so let me just show you this in a little bit more detail. And if you don't have a financial plan like this, then you're seriously in trouble. You need to just rethink things, okay? So here you can see um, new patient functional medicine consults, how many, how many labs you're going to sell, how many supplements you're selling, follow-up consults, right? So you can populate all these numbers here. And then on the expense sheet, you type in all your different expenses. Oops, sorry. So you figure out how much everything's costing you, right? And then it calculates for you what your actual profit is. And it's very enlightening to start to see, well, wait a minute, my payroll tax and employee benefits and salaries and wages are adding up to be 32% of my income, you know, and really starting to crunch the numbers so you can see how um, financially viable what you wanna do is. And if you run through financial planning worksheets like that five or 10 times, you will have a very good idea of whether what you're doing is a good idea or not, you know? And you can basically sort through things on paper 
so you don't end up making this critical er error, you know, um, which I've seen so many times. We just don't want people to do that. Okay, we want to use it to avoid that as much as possible. All right, so and in fact, I can upload that into the thing here so you guys can have a copy of that. We spent a long time developing it. There's a, here, drag and drop the file. Let me drag and drop that here. And then you can go download it right now. Okay, let me just put it in the little thing here. Hang on one second for you guys. I wasn't planning on doing this, but what the heck, you guys can have this. Um, hang on one sec, let me get that figured out. Oh, I'll do it at the end, okay? You guys can download it. Take me a second. Okay, so then, again, back to the original thing I was talking about is that one of the most important things is to have a clear business model that is incorporating a clinical model. If you can have these two things together, you've got it made. And this is a system that I've been using and I've been teaching this system since 2006 quite successfully. So I've been using this system for about, 20 years or more and teaching it for what's that uh 16 years hundreds of doctors have used this and it's not just me that it works for okay this can be really effective so if you don't like this system or you want to take this idea and modify it please do but you know having this kind of a structure some kind of a structure makes a big difference so start off or the way that i think about it is we have a model for how a clinical model for how people get sick and it, simply put, it's due to stress and stress hormones, catecholamines, neurotransmitter-related problems, the whole neuroendocrine system getting screwed up. That has a negative impact on our immune response. That damages the gut. We get leaky gut. GI pathogens start to flare up. And then eventually we start to get toxic. So this is my model for how people get sick. And then at the same time, it's the same model for how we want to work with people. So we test and correct the stress hormones, there are transmitters, mitochondria, we test and correct the gut, and we test and correct the detox system in order to pull people out of this downward cycle. So the clinical model, uh, this is how people get sick, is the business model. And there's a lab test for hormones, one for the gut, and organic acids to cover the detox systems and whatnot, right? And so the clinical model and business model are wrapped together in one little package. And that really helps patients understand what's happening, it helps your staff understand what's happening, so there's not like this completely different thing, every patient, every day, um, which can get super messy, let's say, okay? So um, the biggest mistake that we see besides burnout is, and I guess it leads to burnout, is the high overhead business. So, and I've seen so many of these, and I've been involved myself with creating two or three of these. When I had my first really successful practice, we were bringing in over a million dollars a year. And I thought, wow, I've got it made. But at the end of that year, I only made like, I don't know, it was like 80 or $90,000. I don't know, I calculated by hours you know, I think I was making like $28 an hour or something like that because I was working nonstop. We were bringing in a million dollars, but I had a huge 3,000 square foot clinic in Del Mar, California, which is really expensive rent. We had a gym in the back. I bought all this gym equipment. We had um, a psychiatrist. We had therapists. We had a guy doing brainwave mapping. We had a nutritionist. I had my exercise people doing the gym thing. We had a huge front office with all the staff running around. It was like five or six staff. Okay, we brought in a million dollars, but it cost like $900,000 to run the thing. And so I just walked right into that, you know. And we helped a lot of people, and it was really cool to have this interdisciplinary clinic that I was in charge of. I mean, it was actually a lot of fun. I enjoyed it a lot. But um, I really wasn't making much money, and I didn't see a way out you know, because I was stuck with this high overhead. And just be careful around that, you know. Um, sometimes you can build your dream clinic, but it's not gonna really sustain you in the long term in terms of, you know, finances. So you wanna keep your overhead low. You want your margins to be between 40 and 60%. And, you know, I was at a conference a few years ago and I did this over and over again for a couple of years is I would ask everybody, I, I can't see you guys, unfortunately, because we're on an online thing, but I would ask everybody, okay, 
you know, who's got their margins between 40 and 60 percent? And like two people in the back will put their hands up. And then I would say, okay, who even knows what a margin is? And if you get a room of physicians <laughs> together, the vast majority of them are like, well, I'm not really even sure what a margin is. So if you're in that category, as I was, you know, you don't even know what your margins are, let alone what the term means, then you can go back to our financial planning document here. And you really need this, okay? Because this will show you what your margins are. Uh, let me show you the document again. Go back to your financial planning document here, okay? And you fill out the first part, which is your income, and then go to the second page and do all your expenses, and then it'll calculate for you down at the bottom uh, your total operating expenses and your net profit or net profit margin, okay? And you should have, so if you have a 40% margin, that's, you know, somewhere between 40 and 60%. You want, you want as much as possible, you want to keep your expenses as low as possible, right? Um, and it's surprising what small numbers can do in terms of really destroying your profit margin. And if your margin is not good, then you end up in trouble over time because you're going to have to work so many hours to try to make up for the fact that your business model is not working really well. So one of the ways that we've saved money, the most money probably that I've been able to save, because when you look at my expenses, it's almost all staff. Um, and that's been true for every clinic I've ever run. The, the vast majority, you know, 70, 80, 90% of the expenses staff, depending on the rent, you know? Rent is probably second. But the more that you can use uh, technology, online scheduling, of course we use full script to do all our supplements so we don't, I don't stock and sell my own supplements like I used to. We use Rupa to distribute all the labs. If I look at online scheduling, Rupa and full script, those three things together have probably saved at least sixty to eighty thousand dollars in staff expense. And I know because thirty years ago we didn't have online scheduling. I had to pay somebody to schedule by hand, right? And call people by, you know, with by phone. It was all none of it was automated. We didn't have full script, so we would stock and sell all our own supplements. And we didn't have Rupa, so we would stock and sell uh, all our own lab kits. And the amount of follow-up that you have to do for selling supplements and selling labs, it just takes a huge amount of staff time. And that's gonna be your major expense. So the more that you can leverage things like Rupa and Fullscript and online scheduling, the more you can drop your overhead, the more efficient you can be. That's really what makes the business work, okay? And in the years when I had you know five or six staff people running around doing all that for me, distributing the labs instead of Rupa, selling the supplements instead of Fullscript, doing them scheduling manually instead of an online scheduler. You know, it's just a nightmare. We even have our um, online schedule now set up so that when the patient schedules, it takes their credit card. So we don't even have to collect money anymore for consultations. They sign up for a 30 minute consult, enter your credit card here, credit card gets billed. We never get that information. So we don't store credit card information at all. We're not in trouble. You can't get into trouble by having some somebody hack into your system. Just done all online. We get the money, the credit card thing is all encrypted and it's done. So we don't, I have zero collections, right? Because people pay when they schedule, super, super simple. Um, all right, and then I always like to talk about patient communication skills because that I think is really the main driver of all these businesses. And if the better you are at patient communication skills, the better you're gonna get with patient compliance and the longer, people are gonna stick with you and the more they're gonna be likely to refer. And so we also had a breakthrough a long time ago when we started to sell more complete programs. So for many years, I would just sell people like a month supply, like a bottle of each thing that they needed. And then we started a um, incentive program with my staff back in San Diego in those days. It's like 20, 25 years ago. And I gave them a bonus every time they sold some supplements. And so pretty quickly they figured out that if I was designing a six month adrenal program, that they would make more on their commissions if they would just say to the patient, Dr. Kelly wants you to do a six month you know, adrenal program. Would you like either a three or six month supply? And people go, oh, well, I don't know. I'll take three months worth, thanks. So we literally tripled our supplement sales overnight. We have been selling like six to $8,000 a month worth of stuff. And then when they implemented this like sell complete programs idea, we started selling 
20-ish, $20,000 a month range, you know? And then the what I saw from that was, I didn't really care about the money, to be honest. I don't really care about making money at all. But what I saw from that was that people were more compliant because patients would come back and I'd be, how are you doing? i say, oh, I'm doing pretty well, you know? And then, yeah, I'm at the month five of my six month program, I'm about to run out of stuff. And what I realized was that when people bought complete programs for three months or six months or whatever, they stayed on them. It solved my compliance problems. It wasn't even intentional or anything brilliant on my part. It was just sort of a coincidental side effect of my staff wanting to make more from commissions. And then I realized, wow, so now we only sell programs. I'm like, how long is this parasite program for? It's for two months. And you, there's no point in buying a month worth of a two month parasite program, right? So everybody just buys things in a programmatic way as a complete program rather than getting a bottle or two of things and then getting everything else from Amazon, right? And that's the last thing you want is people buying things off of Amazon. So the more that you can educate people, the more that you can get involved in offering better quality service, in this case, the service of not having them run out of supplements to get a complete program, the better your compliance can be, okay? Now, I was never very good at patient communication. When I first came into practice, the first doctor that was training me sent me to communication workshops, and I had to do these for quite some time. Um, he made me do it, basically, kind of insisted I do it. And then I started to get better at it by watching Glenn deliver the information to patients and by doing these communication workshops. I really started to get better at it. It probably took me two or three years, um, but eventually I started to understand, you know, how to communicate better with people, especially people who are in pain or not doing very well. And so just a couple of things that are kind of obvious, but I'll mention, you know, the first step with every new patient is developing rapport. And if you miss that step, then they're not going to come back. You know, they're not going to be a long-term patient. And so however you do that on an energetic, emotional, spiritual level, uh, you know, it just has to be this connection that the person has and they really trust you. Um, I like to use what I call this condition description technique, which is always describing what I want them to do in the words of their condition. So if I want them to do... Uh, an adrenal lab and a GI test that if they're overweight, the reasons why I want them to do that all have to do with fat burning. If they're tired all the time, the reasons why I want them to do that all have to do with the energetics of the adrenal glands and how cortisol and DHA relate to our sense of energy and mood. And the more that you can get in the patient's head and understand where they're coming from, the more easy it is to explain these things, and those that's really where you get your compliance. So that I don't have a generic description for why I want you to do an organic acids test. It's going to vary depending on what's going on with that person, and that served me really, really well. When I used to just describe the features and benefits of the test in a generic way, it's just not compelling enough for people to really want to do it. Um, okay. And then this is what I want to dwell on for a few minutes, and then I'll stop and we can do questions, okay? Uh, okay. So we do, yeah, let me just do a couple minutes on the follow-up, and then I'll get to all the questions. So keep typing in your questions. I'll leave plenty of time for that, okay? Um, Follow up because this is where I see that one of the biggest problems, and this is something you can work on right away on your own. You don't have to pay an expert to do this. So you want to learn where patient follow up and patient sales are declining. What step is that happening in? And then create a system for catching these predictable dropout points and reversing the trend. And it doesn't have to be more complicated than a than an Excel spreadsheet, a little worksheet. And let me show you here. So when we did this in my practice, and I've done this several times, I've done this probably at least three or four times, we create a patient process flow. This is every step that a new patient goes through, from the first day that they contact us to the point where they're on a long-term maintenance program, okay? So the first step is obviously that they inquire via email, phone call, whatever it is. So then you have to have this scripted, you have to have your staff scripted. So when they, someone calls on the phone and says, what does Dr. Kayleys do? That They have a script that they are not memorizing and reading from, but they have a script you train them in. They use their own words, but they have to follow the script. So they, the patient gets a very clear description of what you do, why you do it, how you do it, what's your clinical model, right? That's where the model comes in. And very easy for my staff to say, oh, well, you know, Dr. Kayleys is an amazing guy, you know, and he's a... Uh, 
um, that was a joke. And he he works with this model that he's created where he does these three body systems. So he's systems oriented and he tests and corrects adrenal and GI uh, problems. And he does this organic acids test, which is really quite complex. And he's you know an expert at lab interpretation. Doesn't treat you know specific symptoms or diseases at all. Um, and he's really into lifestyle coaching, you know, something like that. So you have a really clear description of what you do that you can fade so that, that this goes well. Okay. And if people are inquiring at a great rate, but not becoming new patients, no, you got to work on this. And then the new patient consult, same thing. If they're coming in as a new patient, but they're not buying labs, then you need to go back and look at your scripting and what you're saying during the new patient consult. So you can describe to the person more, uh, directly and more with more in a more compelling way why they should purchase the labs now if they're buying the labs but they're not coming back for their lab review consult then you have to figure out a series of emails or phone calls they're going to capture them there if they're doing the lab reviews but they never buy their supplements again you can see how this is going right so you have a bucket for each one of these and if the bucket's leaky you got to fix that one to the point where they're buying programs, they're doing follow-up consults, they're reordering their supplements, they're doing another follow-up consult, they're redoing their lab tests, and eventually they're put on a long-term maintenance program. So you want to sketch out this entire process for your particular clinic, and then you have a spreadsheet. And when we did this, we did it in a very low-tech way. I'm sure you could buy some customer management system and do this in a complicated way. All we did was have an Excel spreadsheet that we looked at every day, and we used our email program to do the follow-up. So the spreadsheet would have these 10 buckets, right? Inquired, did new patient consult, bought labs, did the lab review, bought supplements, like that, right? These things just listed out. And then we have names in each column. And here are the people that did this. Here are the people that inquired. And then here are the people that did the new patient consult. So we could see, oh, well, there's all these people that inquired, but they never did a new patient consult. Maybe we should follow up with them. And then a whole list of people who did the new patient consult but never bought their labs. So we well, right? And if you do this for a while and you contact all the new patients who came in as a new patient but never bought labs, you say, hey, this is Dr. Kalish's office. We just noticed that you did your consult but you never bought your labs. Can we help you? Any glitches, any problems that we can help with? You'll figure out what is going wrong and be able to fix it. So if you can get a very well-defined new patient process flow all the way from when they first inquire to when they're on a long-term maintenance program, your business will run smoothly. It will eliminate the need for a lot of new patients because that one individual new patient will last and stay around a lot, lot longer, and they will eventually become an ongoing maintenance patient, and you will eventually have a full practice because these people, so many people are sticking around with you. The new patient concern goes away. If you don't have a good patient process flow, you're gonna think that you need more patients. That's what I was saying in the very beginning. This is the main problem right here. If you can fix this, it's like, and from the doctor perspective, you end up offering a much better service. I mean, it's much better to actually keep people in your life and keep people healthy than it is to fix them and then they go away and they get screwed up again in some way, right? So this is better practitioner Ing. This is better doctoring. This is being a better practitioner as well as a better business model. And it's not really about making money. It's about how you're going to take care of people in a more comprehensive way. And if you have a really good system like this set up, and there's many times when we experience um, really good systems like this. And then many times when we experience really bad systems, if you think about, um, I don't know, if you go to like, what's a good example, like a really nice restaurant, you know, and at my favorite restaurant ever um, is in New York, 11 Madison Park. And it, it, that restaurant, you walk in and there's just they've just thought of everything. For years, they've thought of everything. And you could be sitting down. This happened to me when I was there for dinner years ago, sitting down. And I just kind of made a move like I was going to get up. I didn't even stand up. I just was leaning <laughs> towards the aisle like I was going to stand up. And someone came up, saw that, came up grabbed me and said, the men's room is over here. And I was like, they were mind readers. You know, they just had a system for what happens to people that eat a meal. And they knew every move that everyone was going to make. And they always had someone right there to fill your water glass, get you a new bottle of wine, make sure you knew where the bathroom was. And when we were leaving the restaurant that evening, 
it was raining really hard and I had to wait for a cab for a while. So I was kind of stuck at the, the front door with the guy that checks you in. And I was saying, how do you guys do this? And he said, oh, well, look up there. At the top of the restaurant, they had a second floor that was kind of hidden. They had a huge mirror, but it was a one-way mirror, right? And there was actually people up in the mirror thing looking down. And they had a row of servers at the bar, like five or 10 servers at the bar lined up. And the people up in the control room would call down to the bar and they'd say, okay, table seven needs a new bottle of wine. Table 10 looks like that guy's going to go to the bathroom in a minute. And so people were constantly pumping out under instructions from this hidden group of people. So the service was just flawless. You want your clinic to run like that, where you're anticipating every single little thing that a patient's gonna need, and then you're providing it in real time right when they need it. If you can get that figured out, when we did this first patient process flow, I went from wanting new patients, I'm not exaggerating, went from wanting new patients to having a two month wait list in about two or three months. Just by doing this, I didn't change my personality. I didn't get better at interpreting labs. I didn't move and get a nicer location. All we did was change the patient process flow. And I went from being semi-desperate for new patients to having a two-month wait list. I mean, this really, really works. And it works quickly um, if you can implement it. It's just a lot of organizing. And it goes back to the beginning here, which is the three Ps, right? Which is putting all the energy into your practice at the same level as you do into your patient care and then making sure that you're taking care of yourself as well, okay? So then a quick little thing here before we wrap up, if you came late, we have our Business Essentials boot camp. I'll do questions in one minute, okay? We have our Business Essentials boot camp starting in February. This is one of pretty, most years is our most popular class, to be honest, Mini 23. If you wanna work on your business, financial planning, business planning, strategy, all that kind of stuff. We'll have a bunch of live calls. You can ask questions. It's a really good group of people that take this. It's mostly practitioners that are getting ready to start a practice. And then a few that have been in practice for a long time, but it's most people, mostly people that are in their first couple of years of doing this and really want to get off to a good start. Okay, it's a well-run course. We've been doing this for a bunch of years and kind of have the whole system down for how this works for you, okay? So it's a great class, I encourage you to take it. If you're interested, you get a big discount, 20% off with that code. We have our mentorship one year lab interpretation advanced course starting in January also. If you just wanna start a practice, you wanna get the clinical training and the business modeling, this is really what the mentorship is. And I walk you through every week, we have a session together with a group of other doctors reviewing your labs, there's a whole curriculum online where you learn how to interpret the test and then you apply it in real time in the class, okay? And if you're not using Rupa yet, I've been talking a lot about them. You should check out Rupa, get a hundred bucks off right there, all right? So now I'm gonna grab some questions here. Do you cover telehealth practices in the Business Essentials Bootcamp? Yep, absolutely. As a matter of fact, there's a whole section on that and um, also something you can ask about in class. Um, I would say probably a third of the people that take that class are doing telehealth. And it's a little different. The rules are a little different and there's different legal strategy and legal issues you need to deal with too, okay? Um, let's see, I wanna do the business boot camp. Not sure if it's appropriate because I'm a nurse practitioner. No, you can totally do it if you're a nurse practitioner. We've had tons of nurse practitioners do that. Um, so Jennifer, you can contact me if you want. We can chat about that or, or you can sign up and we can talk about it in class. Um, it's a little complicated. Maybe you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one call for a minute and I can tell you what that, how that would work as a nurse practitioner. Um, oh, maintenance program that I offer patients? That's a really good question from Sheila. So my ultimate goal is to get the patient that wants to get pregnant or the patient that wants their hair to grow back in or the patient that wants their toenail fungus to go away or the patient that has chronic fatigue, whatever it is, to get them well and then to keep them well with a once a year check-in. And so my maintenance program is a once a year check-in and a once a year organic acids test. It gives me so much information. Sometimes we might do a GI panel too, but usually not. Once a year organic acids test, a revamping of their diet, their supplement program based on that test. We look at detox pathways, glycolysis, beta oxidation, the whole mitochondrial thing, neurotransmitter issues, oxidative stress, cardiovascular disease prevention, diabetes prevention, cancer prevention, just general wellness health stuff from organic acids. It gives you a huge amount of information. And once you learn how to interpret that test well, then the yearly consults are great. And they go fast. It seems like a 
I have patients that have been doing, I don't know what we're up to, maybe 10 or 12 yearly checkups. We have 10 or 12 organic acids labs just laid out in front of us. And we get to see where they were, where they are now, what their health is, what they need to focus on with their diet and supplements. And so to me, that's the ultimate service. And then from a business model perspective, those people buy supplements every month. And, you know, that's one of the things that helps support the practice. Um, so it's where it kind of works out for everybody. Uh, let's see. Um, so, uh, so the different kinds of practitioners that we train, um, we train acupuncturists, chiropractors, nurse practitioners, medical doctors, osteopaths. We have a social worker right now. We have a couple of pharmacists in the training program. I have trained dentists in the past. I don't know if we have any dentists right now. I don't think we do. So there's a wide variety of practitioners that practice functional medicine. And really on the mentorship calls, we might have five MDs, two chiropractors, three acupuncturists, and a naturopath, all mixing it up in the same call, all talking about their cases. And it's really a, quite a wonderful experience. And you get the medical doctors chiming in saying, oh gosh, that patient was on that medication and that's a little dangerous because of this. And then the chiropractors are always saying, well, did you check their neck? You know, <laughs> maybe they have, the pain is coming because they need an adjustment. So it's really wonderful to have these different groups. And when I first started teaching, I thought we would separate it out and have like an MD group and a DC group and a nurse practitioner group. But it turns out that it's actually better to work cooperatively across these different professional lines, but then everyone has the same goal of learning how to interpret functional medicine labs. Um, and I've, it's just been, it's a really rewarding group setting. Uh, I think most people find it uh, quite satisfying that way. Okay. Um, Let's see, Paul is saying, my practice turns 36. My practice turns 36. Paul is not 36, her practice is 36. Um, yeah, and so for COVID, COVID was, you know, very destructive for a lot of practices, very destructive. And when COVID first hit, we started at the Kales Institute a telehealth telemedicine class. And I did it for free for a while. Some of you may have been in that. We had 1,400 people signed up for that free class because I was like, oh, shit, this is not good. <laughs> you know, all these practices are going out of business. Okay, everybody, get on the phone, order some lab kits. And we really helped a lot of practitioners survive. And a lot of those people are still with me now and are doing quite well. Um, and so I'm very into telehealth as a backup option. I'm very into telehealth, telemedicine as a primary option. Um, there's a lot of legal hurdles you got to get around and figure out. So there's some special things you need to do, but it's very doable and um, something I definitely strongly encourage, especially if you took a hit from COVID. Okay. Um, let's see here. Yeah. So I'll, I will share the financial spreadsheet. Let me figure out how to do that before the class is over. Okay. We'll give it another minute. I'll do it in a minute. Um, see here oh online scheduler um let me show you I, I think you can see it let me show you here real quick um let me see if i can just pull it up should be able to do anything here we go Oops, here's my website and new patients and schedule. Here we are. It's Acuity is the name of the program. And this is kind of what it looks like on the free side. But obviously this is a free, so we don't charge people. But when we do the paid consult, then people, um, people uh, enter their credit card information. So, you know, think about it, like, I don't collect, I don't have to pay staff to collect anything anymore, you know? So we have, we have, um, here, I'm trying to upload the file while I'm talking here. We have, all the labs are paid through Rupa, all the supplements are paid through Fullscript. Um, we have all the consults paid through Acuity. 
So we don't even have a reason to bill anymore. And that really nice thing also, kind of the side derivative of that is that we don't have to worry about um, holding onto people's credit cards, you know, because all these programs are just doing that for us. They're processing the credit card and it's hidden from us. We never see it or get it. So there's no kind of liability um, in that way, you know, which always kind of made me nervous. I'm trying to upload this document and I can't for some reason. So I will just have it emailed out to you guys, okay? So check your email box for something from us. For the follow-up email, we'll make sure I include that financial spreadsheet. Sorry about that. It's not letting me upload for some reason. How do you show patients their lab results via telehealth appointment? Um, so some practitioners like to work with a screen, like a Zoom screen uh, or go to webinar screen or something so the patient can see it on the screen. In the old days, I used to actually do that and record things and then see, send people a copy of the recording. Now I don't do that anymore. I, I think it's a good idea though, because so people can have it. What we do now is we, um, uh, you know, the patient gets a copy of their lab uh, automatically so they have a copy of it in front of them when I'm talking to them but I don't think it's a bad thing if you can get a HIPAA compliant system to to do it in that way you know where you're recording it uh, oh this is Jennifer Jennifer set up a call with me and we can talk about business model stuff Yeah, and there, there's a bunch of ways. So what's happening in the industry now is there's a really big shift to uh, direct-to-consumer lab sales. So health coaches can now buy labs as of this year. There's Rupa has a physician authorization program where if you're a health coach, you can have a physician on the Rupa staff authorize the sale of the lab to your customers or clients. Um, and there's other ways that you can order labs directly too if you're a practitioner who has a difficulty getting the lab testing done. So there's, most of the lab companies have kind of solved that problem in the past year or so, okay? Uh, so if you're in the course for the one year, is the business essentials worth it? Yeah, so a large percentage of the mentorship students take the business class also. Um, that's been a common combination. They're pretty different, and I think they're both are kind of synergistic. Uh, what are the ideas about IV overhead, about IV therapies uh, or ozone therapies? So I'm really a fundamental functional medicine lab kind of person. So my whole shtick is, you know, organic acids, fatty acids, amino acids, adrenal hormones, female hormones, GI microbiome. And I leave the fancy stuff like IVs and peptide, that's and that, and all the other complicated stuff. I've always stayed away from. Even when we had my interdisciplinary clinic, we had a pretty low key version of, of all these things. And I'm just a firm believer in doing the basics really well. Um, now for some practitioners, when they pencil out the numbers, and it just goes back to the financial spreadsheet, which I can't upload, which I'll send you a copy of. If it pencils out well and you go, oh, well, if we do IVs, it only takes up this one room and the rent on the room is this amount. and you have to pay the nurse this amount to monitor it, and here's the profit level. So I would suggest for those of you thinking about multiple revenue streams, that you make sure that you fill out the financial spreadsheet um, for the different things, right? So for example, do a monthly forecast just for the IVs with the expenses associated with the IVs, so you can see how that pans out. Do a monthly forecast just for your chiropractic visits, with the expenses for that. Do a monthly forecast just for your acupuncture and then see that how that compares to your functional medicine consultations as an acupuncturist, right? So you should look at all these things separately so you can see what your profit margins are for these different areas. And a lot of times practitioners add in new treatments and they're actually losing money from them, right? So you wanna be careful to make sure that you're not kind of cannibalizing your own practice in that way, okay? Uh, do we have a refresher course? Uh, yeah, so Gerald, uh, contact me and um, we can talk about that. We have a ton of new things I've built out and also some other things for old mentorship people that want to come back. You can set up a, you just contact my office and they'll give you a, a, a link to my schedule. We can talk about that. Uh, um, yes, I work very closely with the health coach and um, that's been really one of the better things that's happened to my practice. Not to my practice, to me because she deals with 
110 percent the hassles that I used to. So that's been just uplifting. Are we offering an organic acids boot camp? We are. As a matter of fact, I I will show you. We are. And uh, let me find it here because I know I know we are because I'm working on the curriculum for it. Let me show you. We have a sh uh, here. Oh my gosh. I've been really busy doing curriculum development, you guys. Let's see if it pops up on the website in the end or not. Uh, classes, you go to the Cash Institute website, you go to classes, boot camps, you got adrenals, business boot camp, lab wording essentials, GI, GI effects, long haul. No, it's not posted yet, apparently. No, it, it's going to be right after the GI one, okay? So it's coming up um, in the spring, the organic acids boot camp. It's coming up in the spring. Uh, let's see. Sounds like you charge patient before they come in. How do you handle cancellation? So can, uh, cancellations, um, we get we charge. If you cancel less than 24 hours, you get charged for your appointment. Yeah. Um, thinking about the lab essentials mentorship. But would you need to do the business boot camp too? I would say half the people that do the mentorship do the business boot camp. Sometimes they do the business boot camp first, and then they go, oh, I like this mentorship thing. I'm going to sign up for it. Sometimes they do it the opposite way. They're in the mentorship. They're like, oh, I really want to work on my business. And they sign up for the business boot camp. Some people do them both together on the same day. They're like, I'm, gonna, I'm all in. I'm going to do this business class. I'm going to do this mentorship class. I want to start a practice. Um, so if you have questions about that, just feel free to contact the office and you can set up a call time with me. I can tell you more details about that, okay? Um, but you don't have to do, they're, they're created independently and many people just do one and not both. Um, let's see, I'm going to see if there's any more questions here. I think I covered them all. Uh, Let's see, do we, are we over? Oh, we're over time. One last question. How do you charge for lab interpretation? Uh, I charge just my regular hourly fee for lab interpretation, uh, which is really high. So it's a little more than most people probably want to charge. But most practitioners, I would say these days, are charging around $400 to $500 an hour. And you would charge the same amount for time when you're speaking to a patient as you would for time not speaking to the patient. I don't know if you've been doing your taxes lately, but I have because it's January. There's all kinds of tax planning. And my CPA, who I love dearly, I'm not against my CPA. He's a wonderful human being, and we laugh and cry together all the time every year. And he's gotten me through a lot. But when I talk to David and I say, okay, well, you know, here's my, you know, financial planning stuff for next year. What's my estimated tax is going to be? I get a bill for our time talking together, and it's a lot because he charges a lot because he's really good. And then I get another bill for him figuring out what I need to do when I wasn't talking to him. And that's normal. Everybody does that, right? Every practitioner does that. You may never see the radiologist. They read their x-rays. You get a bill still, even though you didn't talk to your radiologist. So I charge for my time for doing lab interpretation outside of patient hours as much as I same exact fee structure as we charge for when we're talking to patients. That's really important because you can't really work for free, okay? All right, gang, I'm going to wrap it up now. Thank you for all the wonderful questions, and I look forward to meeting with some of you in these courses coming up. Okay, bye for now.